Ah, Mystery Science Theater 3000. The greatest television program in the history of the universe. Oh, that's right, I said it! Come at me, Comedy Central Executive Circa 1996 and Sci-Fi Channel Executive Circa 1999. And also, Gramercy Pictures Publicity Department. The show was loaded with great musical moments, both full original songs in the host segments, and covers, parodies, and other ditties sung in the theater segments. It's not unusual to steal trucks from anyone. This particular entry originated in a theater segment, just simple lyrics added to the movie score. These lyrics, to be precise. This is the song written for the train chase. This is the chase, Rocky and Ken. He tried to kill me with a forklift. Olay! But then it grew. There were reprises. They added it to a medley. It became a meme. It stuck with Misty's for years and years, and it still makes me smile. This reference alone makes the Fugitive Alien Saga essential viewing for anyone curious about the world of MST3K. Geek Vision. In the not too distant future, next Sunday AD, there was a show where I list things, and my name begins with D. Was is that a self-rhyme? D and A-D? I don't know, I might be cheating. Welcome to the D-List! Mystery Science Theater 3000, the funniest television show of all time. And between an upcoming brand new season on Netflix, a wide net of alumni doing wonderful riffing projects of their own, and a recent reunion special where we got to hear them all riff together, there has never been a more exciting time to be a fan of the show that perfected movie riffing. So I thought I'd celebrate by looking at the show's second most popular aspect. Here are my top 12 favorite songs from MST3K. Number 12. Making up lyrics to the score of the film was a common pastime for the riffers, and once in a while these lyrics would get expanded into their own songs. The most notable instance probably comes from the Fugitive Alien series of films, which provided a memorable piece of score that Joel and the bots turned into a memorable refrain. And then they turned that memorable refrain into a memorable medley. This is the song starting off our medley, our favorite Fugitive Alien song. Don't try to kill us with the forklift, it won't take very long, relax and sing along. Okay, so the forklift part is the most memorable part, but I think it alone is enough for this song to warrant inclusion on the list. I mean, no Misty has ever looked at a forklift the same way again since these episodes. Still, the rest of the medley is pretty great. Some parts become memorable through sheer repetition. I love Ken, he is my sweet friend, and I love him. And as a bonus, the medley includes a second song about their hatred of a certain producer of localizations. We Stick it to Sandy Frank and sit on his chest and gob on his face and make him cry. Number 11. With a pickle mind, we kick the nipple beer as steady as a goat. We're flying over trout. Sometimes the movie doesn't give the riffers much to latch onto, and the host segments end up being off topic. Other times, the movie gives the riffers so much to latch onto that they can basically just reenact scenes from the film in the host segments, and it ends up being hilarious. Two of Pod People's host segments are basically just sweeting scenes from the movie with only minor embellishment. Mini on the road now. Mini in control. Wheels on fire. Burning rubber tires. Which brings us to Idiot Control Now, a Mondegreen-laden cover of a song from Pod People, performed by Joel and the Bots, that is just so damn catchy. Honestly, I don't have anything to say about this song that they didn't say themselves. Pretty good. What do you think? It stinks. Number 10. All right. Yeah. Ow. Ow, ow, boogie. Ow. Back in the funky 70s. After sitting through a piece of a re-edited Gemini Man episode, which is a subject I might know something about, 
Servo announces his song about the 70s. Ow, ow, back in the super bad 70s, the Roman Empire still reigns supreme. And yeah, the joke here is obvious, and the punchline to the scene is even more obvious, but it's still effective, and it really showcases their ability to capture any musical style they choose. Do you? Number nine. I was alone with the world to tame. I was evil but feeling blue. So I'm a sucker for cheesy theme songs, and this ditty with lyrics like a sitcom theme and a presentation like a variety show theme is. Well, it's just perfect. I had a void in the shape of you. Looking for love, hoping for evil. All I got was chicken cordon blue. I would put this song against any theme song written by Alan Thicke. I wonder if I can hire the Mads to write a theme for my life. Ruling the world with our heads in a swirl and it's key. Living in deep thirteen. Number eight. Oh, I wish I was back in old Canada, a land which I never shall lampoon. Roused Hour's adventures drudge up some Canadian resentment in Mike and Crow, so Servo comes to the Great White North's defense. Until Mike and Crow hijack it. Oh, I wish I was stuck in the hills of Alberta drinking beer with some big dumb guy trapping fur. As he scraped and he chiseled all the moose dung off his boots, I would learn that he's the Prime Minister. Oh, stop that! A fine entry into the pantheon of satirical faux anti-Canada songs, this song doubles as a mockery of Canadian stereotypes and a mockery of mockeries of Canadian stereotypes, as Servo's lack of nuance strips any cleverness away, revealing the ugly viciousness underneath. Just where the hell does Canada get off sharing a border with countries far superior to it? Yikes. Why, you lousy, stinking, francophonic, bacon-loving bastards, your country's just a giant piece of... Number seven. Lyle Wagner's a total jerk. Second only to Tommy Kirk. A Catalina caper has given Servo a bit of a crush. A crush he seems more confused by than anybody. That fishy story you tell always makes me sleepy. But that's just what I get for dating a girl that's creepy, my. And the only way to express a crush like that is with doo wop. And a. Surprising inability to spell. R is for the gifts you give me every time you smile. The first E is for, uh, well, I don't really know, but the second E is really a grammatical thing, because otherwise it would be creppy girl, and where would that leave us? This song came early enough in the show's run that not everybody had yet taken for granted just how amazing Kevin Murphy's singing voice is. Suck on that, guy who hates Tom Servo's new voice. Who won't you be my I'll give you scrolls and fish and tinker toys and wine. I'll ditch these guys if you'll be my creepy girl. Number six. Outlaw of Gore is a sci-fi fantasy with elements of sword and sandal, so naturally it contains a lot of skin. And Mike and the Bots pay homage to this fact with a supercalifragilisticexpialidociously catchy tune. It's Brestica, Bubacal, Chestica, Mamical, Pendular, Globular, Fun. I think it's a fair assumption that most Misties get this song stuck in their head when they encounter gratuitous nudity. Is it gluteal maximal, tushital cracula, bunula morning till night? But I think the thing that makes this song work for me is just how much fun they're having with it. How joyous they are, not necessarily about the nudity itself, but just about the celebration. Even Gypsy gets in on it. So for me, this song isn't just a statement about the movie itself, but rather a tribute to how happy they are when they find something to celebrate in these terrible movies they're watching. And they don't always find something to celebrate, so they're grateful when they do. Number five. Once again, we return to Pod People for the big faux emotional closer. Tell me where does all the magic go? 
When the curtain falls to end the show Do the clowns always cry When they pack up the paper sky Joel bids farewell for the episode with the mantra that doesn't make much sense, but he's very passionate about it. The lock is on the old stage door. Will there still be a clown in the sky for me? And despite there not being an iota of seriousness behind the emotion, it still kind of works. It worked so well that the soundtrack albums for the series were named after this song. Tell me where is that clown in the sky for me? I love you, Tom Servo. I love you, Joel. I love you, Crow. You're not my real father. What do you think, sirs? It stinks. Number four. Steve's a werewolf, but he's my guy. He's different from the rest, I don't know why. Written by Mary Jo Peel, this fantastic pastiche of girl groups from the past covers that old standard trope, the dead boyfriend. In this case, the dead boyfriend just happens to be a werewolf. Where, oh, werewolf, I've lived everywhere. That's not even really the reason he died, other than slippery paws. To make a point, it wasn't that far. Take the Hiawatha exit left at the first stop sign. Oh, whose story is this, Carol? The bots ended up in drag quite a lot. And I gotta say, they really pull it off. I held his paw and I touched his cold nose. That means he's healthy. Werewolf is already one of the best episodes from the run of the show, and between this song and the Tusk closing credits bit, it's also one of the most musical. Susie, where, oh, werewolf, I've looked everywhere. Number three, there's this subgroup of Misties who claim that Pearl Forrester wasn't a good character and that the host segments in the sci-fi channel years were somehow inferior. I think this song serves as proof that those people are factually incorrect. When loving lovers love, they're loving love on wings of gold and loving love. We Everything about this song is flawless, from the inane repetitive lyrics to the absolutely earnest performance by Mary Jo Peel, the, the straight look at the camera kills me every time. Love is all we seem to need when we're in loving love. And then Brain Guy comes in and just sends it right over the top. Your heart has wings to fly. And no one else can fly. I really can't say why. I really do like pie. I know a couple of guys. I they really do like pie. And, and loving, loving lovers, lovers love as loving lovers love. Number two. Open up your heart and let the Patrick Swayze Christmas in. We'll gather at the Roadhouse. Penned by Michael J. Nelson, who just might have a bit of an obsession with Roadhouse, this tender carol is a loving tribute to the Swayzeest of holidays, and if you've made it this far into the video, this song's probably already a seasonal standard in your house, so... You already know how great it is. Let's have a Patrick Swayze Christmas this year. Or we'll tear your throat out and kick oh. you in the ear. Oh, hold it a sec, Cam, but stop it. And my number one favorite MST3K song, What's Better Than One Kevin Murphy Singing? How about a whole chorus of them? I gotta stop wearing spoilers. Here's to the guys and gals who like to fly. Flying so high with some guy in the sky. sky. More 
or less a medley of song lyrics that have something to do with flight. What sells this is how seriously the multiple servos take the song and how beautiful they make it sound. <laughs> Wouldn't you like to fly in my beautiful balloon? Take these broken wings and learn to fly me to the moon. And between the gorgeous harmonies and the elaborate puppeteering, I can't even begin to imagine what went into the song behind the scenes. But I did recently talk to somebody who would know. Putting the vocal tracks together was was easy. I, I can harmonize with myself pretty easily, so that wasn't too hard. Um, but making poor Jeff Maynard and Pat Brancic and uh, and Bees, I think, making the prop department put together all those servos so that they would perform in sync was a phenomenal task, and uh, and uh, they did a fantastic job of that. I mean, first of all, getting what was it, eight servos all together on stage at once to synchronize with their heads and their little beaks was uh, a phenomenal task and they, they, they pulled it off. It was fantastic. And those are my very favorites, but I haven't even begun to scratch the surface of great MST3K songs. And the new season will likely have even more, with potential guest stars like Jack Black and Neil Patrick Harris, and potential guest writers like comedy musicians extraordinaire Paul and Storm, and youngest EGOT winner and parental earworm initiator Bobby Lopez, there is a lot of comedy music talent being poured into the new season. And that's like fifth on the list of reasons I'm excited for it, so I will definitely be lingering around Netflix for a while once that launches. And until next time, this is Dave, signing off. Welcome to the D-List, the show where I list things and my name begins with a D. And I think we're overdue for a return to the musical world of MST3K. A few years ago, I listed my favorite songs from the original run of Mystery Science Theater 3000 in anticipation of the then-upcoming revival, a revival that ended up having even more songs written by such extraordinary talents as Paul and Storm and that guy who's the youngest, quickest EGOT and the only double EGOT. Jeez, Bobby, leave some talent for the rest of us. And now there's another revival on the way, complete with its own streaming service and a rotating cast. Multiple casts for Mystery Science Theater? My lifelong dream of playing Tom Servo just might be achievable after all. Come on, I can have a mighty voice. I'm good enough to receive a giant banner from someone complaining that they hate Tom Servo's new voice. I can be the new voice that they hate. I even have experience talking one-on-one -on -one with an expert on that mighty voice. So to celebrate MSC3K building its new home where it doesn't have to answer to the whims of a larger network, it's time to visit the last in a string of networks to cancel it, Netflix. Here's my ranking of all the songs from The Return and The Gauntlet, the two Netflix seasons of Mystery Science Theater 3000. Number 14. So in my earlier list, I only included songs in host segments, not musical moments in the theater itself. But then in the Netflix seasons, they started actually doing a few full songs in the theater with instruments and credits at the end, so those gotta be included. Guys, this is really tripping me out. Check out those lights, yeah. Look, some movies just have long, dull, repetitive stretches that are hard to fill with new jokes, so what better way to fill those stretches than with a musical number that would have made the movie itself far more entertaining had it just been included in the first place? I'm just saying, there's a lot of MST2K movies that would have been infinitely more watchable if they were musicals. I've already got my pitch all set for Puma Man, Turn Off the Dark. And when they got to this stretch in Lords of the Deep, yeah, visuals this trippy definitely call for a sitar. Gum could be cheese. I like cheese. Wow. Wow. I think I'll just go to sleep for a while right here. It's a short little number, but it's exactly what was needed to get us through this poor man's 2001 A Sea Odyssey nonsense. Number 13. 
When Keog the Bear Cub escapes from the movie that eventually led to Cave Dwellers, he wreaks havoc on the satellite of love until he's brought back down to Moon 13. Help! Oh, I can't bear this! Ah. Oh, why'd you have to take our Keog? You can't keep a dangerous B-movie monster up there! Max bonds with him, but the bear is taken away by Dr. St. Five, so Max announces that he will mourn the only way he knows how. Guess it's time for my heartfelt song of goodbye. There's a cut on my hand and a pain in my heart. <coughs> uh, <coughs> There's a cut on my hand and a pain in my heart. My feedback is empty. Oh, where shall I start? But then it cuts away, so all we get is that one stanza. Still, nice to see Max carries on his father's tradition of singing mournfully about critters that were taken away from him. Nummy muffin, cocoa butter. Number 12. What do you do when a movie hurts too much? How do you fix the broken places you can't touch? After falling in love with the giant monster Yongari and watching him murdered cruelly and heartlessly, Jonah and the bots are even more disheartened than usual and they just have to sing about it. And their depression drives them to use one of my favorite devices in comedy songwriting, clunky metaphors. Like you're haunted by a monster, but the monster is a movie about a monster who will not leave you alone. Tell me how to please push past the hurting The time is now to please push past the hurting And in the grand tradition of Manos the Hands of Fate, even the mad start to feel some guilt as they come in with the bridge. Is it wrong this torment that we've wrought? Maybe we should be giving some thought to repenting and doing some good for a change. Is it too much to ask? Is it really so strange? Two evil leopards finally changing their spots. Of course, they don't feel it for very long. Nah. <laughs> Push the button, Max. And then they cut the song short, which is funny, but really leaves me feeling unsatisfied. Come on, give us a final chorus to resolve this musically. My ears are on the edge of their seat. Is this part of the torture, Matt? Number 11. In the end of the finale of the Gauntlet season, Jonah and the bots are being loaded up for the then upcoming live tour, but on his way out, he has his revenge on the Mads by hoisting them on their own petard. <laughs> All the old experiments! <laughs> Every episode! <laughs> A theater at the end of the storage facility? And Who knew? I wasn't in the garden with Mr. and Mrs. Adam. But the victory is hollow as Jonah and the bots spend the end credits singing about their continued suffering. Hours and hours of pain. Our sanity's run down the drain. Now the only thing left in my brain is your horrible show. Your show stinks. They do get briefly interrupted by a classic. Idiot control now. Idiot control now. Nitty on the road now. Your show stinks. Your horrible show. Also, I guess nobody in MST3K can return to Earth without at least mentioning Hamdingers. Our souls have been sent through the ringer. Limping cold like an old Hamdinger. We've been stripped to the bone by Kinger in a horrible show. Number 10. After a very catchy song in the first episode of the revival, the next few episodes didn't really have much in the way of songs, but we'd make up for that in episode 4, Avalanche, which has two songs. Let's start with the second. Ladies and gentlemen, the Satellite of Love presents Aloha! Okay, this is less of a comedy song and more of a sketch that has some singing in it, but it's on the soundtrack, so it counts. You can cry, wondering why that guy said goodbye, but snow gets in your eye. In this segment, which might be named after a repeated refrain in the film, Aloha! Oh, she's having an aneurysm. That's charming. Aloha! 
It's like a 70s kitchen got up and danced. Dear TripAdvisor, spend a magical weekend with the owner's mother. She's a bright, sassy lady. Seemed to think we were in Hawaii. We get to hear Florence Gypsy's Lounge Act, which wouldn't have been out of place in the lounge in the resort in the movie, but they were too busy with their white boy disco. They buried me in snow and ice. But I'm here. Of course, it would have been in really poor taste to do all these avalanche jokes at the resort in the movie. While the song itself isn't particularly elaborate, it is a wonderful showcase of Rebecca Hansen's voice, and it's that kind of pastiche of vintage entertainment styles that MST2K has always excelled at. And it's got music by Evan Schletter, who is only the best. Listen to those pipes. Pure PVC. Number nine. Growing magician. I know that you're wishing that you could do all the things that you want to and do them today. After witnessing Simon in Wizards of the Lost Kingdom fail to control an army of the dead, Jonah and Servo act out a follow-up scene where Kor the Conqueror is much more supportive than the low-rent roused hour he is in the actual movie. It's awkward and embarrassing, but it's natural and beautiful too. It's all part of the natural process, the magic inside of you. But Jonah as Kor channels his support for Servo as Simon's budding magical skills into a 50s ditty about puberty and possibly a little bit about abstinence. Simon, someday you'll raise the undead the right way with someone you care about when you're emotionally mature enough to handle the consequences. And then you'll feel the joy of commanding an unstoppable horde of ghouls responsibly and as nature intended. You know, this song just confirms that more after-school specials need to be about responsible use of the dark magics. The kids need to be prepared. Finally ready for sharing the magic inside of you. Number eight. Gather round, people, run over and see the most fabulous thing in the whole galaxy. Towards the end of suffering through a movie about a crappy carnival, Jonah and the bots are visited by P.T. Mindslap, portrayed by an actor who knows his way around both space magic and criminal circus folk. Why don't we just binge season two of Fargo? No! The Great Space Circus Show! Joel Hodgson got in touch with Mark Hamill when he saw that Mark had donated to the Bring Back MST3K Kickstarter, and he asked him if he wanted to cancel on the show. So there's precedent for Kickstarter backers appearing on MST2K revivals. I backed both the Kickstarters. As they glide invisibly through the dark air. Well, who they are really, you'll never quite know. It's the Great Space Circus Show. Mike Slap uses all his showmanship to describe the con, where you can't see anything, but you hear him describe the circus acts. It sounds dangerous with PT Mind Slap. Of strong men possessing an even stronger smell. Sniff as they lived with impossible ease. You'll laugh, you'll cry, you'll possibly sneeze. But I'll give him this. Doesn't sound any worse than the carnival actually in the film. The audience won't have a clue. Well, who you smell, really, you'll never quite know. It's the Great Space Circus Show. I'm an easy mark. Number seven. Plan to dine in the land before time. Hit me with the jingle. Plan to dine in the land before time. Moon 14. Yes, this is also less of a song and more of a sketch that has a jingle, but on the soundtrack. It's probably kosher. <laughs> but who knows? These beasts died off before God made those rules. Do it! Me from before the time there was language. Moon 14. The Mads pitch their new barbecue place where you can finally taste dinosaur meat. If the dinosaurs don't taste you first. Mmm, our t Rexcellent cut. The king of dinosaurs is now king of your stomach. Uh, is he eating the band? No, 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 don't focus on what he's eating. Focus on what you'll be eating. Who he's eating, whatever. Jake all that. Tiny little lunch with great big glamour. Moon 14. It's a 
a solid sketch, and as brief as the Jingle Stings are, they do build on each other, getting funnier and funnier like a little punch at the end of each heightening of the premise. And I just realized I forgot to lock the Allosaurus's pen again. Uh, mm, uh to, to, to the Moon 13 Mesozoic Panic Crew! <laughs> Never should have tampered in God's domain! No, 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 we, we were in serious danger, we don't need a jingle right now! Number six. Our love is on wings you can't see. In the first of Avalanche's songs, longtime Misty Neil Patrick Harris reunites with Felicia Day for another musical number about love in the time of vlogging. Sublime. Let's tie the knot online. And this time, NPH isn't stuck being the pining, unrequited third wheel. Why can't Kanga be that kind of in love with me? Is yeah, I know they're touting the praises, but boy, this makes me happy to no longer be in a long distance relationship. I mean, I'm still in that relationship. We're just married and live in the same apartment now, which is much better than when we were on opposite coasts. Still, it seems to work for them, to a point. If you have coffee breath, I'll never know. There's no physical way I could step on your toe. My love is on wings, virtually. There's no germs when you cough. Huh. Maybe this one was a few years ahead of its time. If you haven't yet and you are able to, please get vaccinated, everyone. I need all of your love. Of course, this time it's Felicia's character who ends up heartbroken, but she still has a better end than she had last time. Dear Diary. Number five. Hit it. Ah, uh, sick beat drop. In episode two of The Gauntlet, King of Demands Jonah and the bots recapture the magic of the previous season by performing a song that will be just as beloved as their first song. Even though she didn't react at all, in earlier that very episode, they reprised a classic Emma C3K song. Open up your heart and let the fashion crazy Christmas in. We're going cruising, ain't never gonna slow down. Dancing like pirates in a punk's a Tony hoedown. I don't think this was necessarily a deliberate reference, but I love that this beginning has the exact same energy as... Friday night, we're gonna party till dawn. Don't worry, Daddy. I've got my favorite dress on. This is not what we had in mind. Yeah, it stinks. A and not in the joke way. It just really stinks. Well, Kinga and Max may not have been satisfied, but I think this one's a lot of fun. It's so easy to use, oh, the joke is that the song is bad, as an excuse to not put effort into a comedy song, but I don't think this one really falls into that trap. In fact, what makes me laugh about this song is how hard you do feel the effort of Jonah and the bots, the pressure to deliver, which is very relatable for anyone who's ever done creative work for hire. And then I really love how Jonah and the bots actually start to get into the groove of the song and start to enjoy it. I wish that part was always true about Work For Hire. We've built a deck with Alex Trebek. Funky disco we got all these And on a meta level, I appreciate that Kinga is demanding that they quickly rush out something that recaptures the success of an unexpected hit while they're watching an Asylum movie. I don't know if that association was deliberate, but it really fits thematically. Number four. Yes, it's another in theater song, but it's a fully fleshed out song with instrumentation and everything that even made it onto the season soundtrack, and I'm glad it did because it's a jam. On the castle run, yeah, nobody can touch her. Let me be the Picard to your Beverly Crusher. The gangway's extended, and we're ready to go. To cover a long stretch of our leading lady slowly boarding a spaceship, Paul and Storm cram every sci-fi reference they can into a Beach Boys pastiche. 
looks like a kitty cat, but rides like an ace. Serenity and slave one, can't keep the pace. Whitley Stryber and Ranieri gonna join in the race. Yeah, my UFO's the coolest GTO in space. Applying the cliches of California car songs to spaceships of the silver screen is a game that works really well, and the song is as catchy as any actual Beach Boys song without needing to worry about royalties going to Mike Love. But to Barada, Nanu, Nanu, make it so And climb into the side of a complete stranger's UFO Don't do it. Don't do it. What a mistake. Don't do it. No! Number three. I see seaweed and more seaweed. Say, I think I see a rave. No, it's just seaweed. Another in theater song, and this is one they go all out for, bringing in Waverly, Growler, and Gypsy. Paradise below the dam. Hey, look, an old rusty shopping cart. I see a MacGuffin. There's the poor man's Richard Chamberlain. Never wear white to a suicide mission. It looks like this was a particularly slow bit of movie, and they did have some spoken riffs for it interjected between the music, but there's still plenty of time to kill with some singing. But though I don't see Barracuda or a school of Ahi Tuna, I'll still rip off Jaws 1 and 2 and 3. Tell my story. Oh my god, that's Tony. I didn't recognize him. He lost weight. Actually, I'm a sprutter. What are you gonna do? I'm dead! In fact, there's so much time to kill, they can even stop to riff their own song. You can spray your poison spray can, we'll still chew you up like bacon. Okay, hold on. Hang in there a second, tin and can well. I let a lot of imperfect rhymes go by in this song, and I didn't say anything, but bacon? It's not even a real word as far as I know. Ah, zip it, Kelsey Grammer! But it honestly does make this stretch fly by. It's an unexpected masterwork of pacing as these sung verses and these spoken riffs weave into each other unexpectedly well. Double cross beat. Hey, language. Strain my heart. Me, me, me. From the title, you might expect this to be an under the sea sound alike, and it's not quite that. But there is a possible lyrical name drop of another Mankin and Ashman Disney song. Be our guest while we ingest you and of all your flesh to vest you. Big show is finished, gang! Oh, so this song gets closure. Still waiting on that end for Push Past the Hurting. Scram before they turn you into spam. We really mean it. What is taking her so long? Also, it has nothing to do with the song itself, but I do have to note that this song occurs about a minute or so after one of the many great theme park jokes in these seasons. I can't believe this. There's never not a line for the Finding Nemo submarine voyage. There must be a parade going on, or I don't know, people got wise that it's just some cartoons projected on a window. I'm going back to Universal. I sailed all the way to the Jurassic Park ride. You know, I never realized how many Universal rides look like concrete bunkers in the jungle. This is what happens when you mix in some SoCal nerds with the Minnesota nerds in the riding staff. Number two. Reptilicus is silly, but he really illustrates the great array of monsters all over the place. Not the first host segment interrupting the first movie of the long-awaited revival had a lot riding on it, and boy, howdy did it deliver. Oh, geez, easy peasy, Mesa amaze. Seeing the Yucatan, you can meet El Cadejo and believe they believe in him, they're not afraid to say so. Confused by Reptilicus's country of origin, the bots ask Jonah to explain all sorts of kaiju from all across the world. Well, duh, Crow, there's a lot that could kill you. Hey, Tom. Sorry, Crow. Okay. Gross. Joe. Yo, Jonah, How's the chorus go? Every country has a monster they're afraid of. And it's a perfect use of so many of Paul and Storm's talents. Their mastery of wordplay, their ability to deep dive into obscure information, and their catchy as all get out compositions. It might be the best song they've written for a beloved franchise since Ballad of the Sneak. What turned the mustard's guts to spaghetti? Was it in Tibet? Yep. I bet he met a Yeti. Australia? Their drop bears will impale ya. Then they'll sell ya hella touristy paraphernalia. And they even managed to work in shout outs to both bare naked ladies. Chickeny China, China, the Chinese chicken! chicken. By that I mean Zhu Fang and Peng, hmm. giant Chinese birds, and oh. one of them yeah, yeah, yeah. turns into a fish. And Def Leppard, or possibly the offspring. Guter Gleibing Glauten Kroben. And the performance by Jonah and the bots is really impressive. I can't imagine how much rehearsal and how many takes it took to get this right without flubbing any major lines. I can barely get through one line of the script without flubbing, and I'm looking at a teleprompter. Might not want to admit that if I'm trying to get hired. 
monster Sasquatch has a country That's Canada a station they call their home For many fans, this song was confirmation that we were in good hands with this revival, and Jonah scrambling with the props was reassurance that despite the increased budget, we would still get some of the homemade charm of the original series. Every monster has a country Yeah, we And my number one favorite song from the Netflix seasons of Mystery Science Theater 3000. Hit it, Joe! What? What? So the word on the street is you got a little movie about time, in particular the day it's gonna end. Huh? Well, friends, an ordinary movie man might make an unassuming 3X structure. I've said it before and I'll say it again. I'm a sucker for a Music Man parody. Of course this is my favorite song from the revival. So yeah, I would be predisposed to like this one, even if it wasn't an absolutely perfect fit for this movie. Gonna be a doozy. You can't lose when you choose to use a lot of concepts. Concepts? Concepts. Gotta stock them up chock full of concepts, premises, plot points, anything and everything. Throw them all at the wall, y'all. Just pack a Patter song is really the only way to do justice to the sheer amount of stuff that the daytime edit throws at its audience, and a flim flam man trying to sell that stuff to the screenwriters makes as much sense as any explanation. But can you help us apply this method to our movie? Darn tootin'! Everybody throw on a skimmer hat and a one-piece striped bathing suit, let's dive right in. <laughs> Octagonal solar powerhouse in the desert with a stable in the back? Not bad for a start, but pals, let me ask you, how's about a pyramid? A pyramid? A great big green glowing pyramid! The first time we watched this episode, as soon as Servo showed up in that Harold Hill getup, Allie turned to me and said, I'm so happy for you right now. My wife knows me well. Dancing in the bedroom, naked as a light green jaybird. Has he got a single thing to do with the moving of the plot? Who cares? I know, did I mention? You're gonna need a kettle full of spaceships. Spaceships! Yeah. Also, this episode had two great Disneyland jokes. Wait, this is Radiator Springs? The Imagineers really phoned it in on this one. Yeesh. Pays to get there early for Fantasmic. The only way the show could handle me any harder is by hiring me. Yeah. Ah, who am I kidding? I could never be half the Robert Preston that Baron Vaughn is. Bring on and on and on and on those cons. Yes. And that's my ranking of songs from MSC3K The Return and MSC3K The Gauntlet. And I can't wait for more song sketches and ripping when the Gizmoplex opens. But what about you? Which songs from these two seasons were your favorites? Let's discuss this all in the comments, and until next time, this is Dave, signing off.